Compressors can be divided into two general categories, positive displacement compressors and dynamic or centrifugal compressors. Positive displacement compressors work by trapping a certain amount of gas and forcing it into a smaller volume. A common type of positive displacement compressor is a reciprocating compressor. This simplified illustration shows two main parts of a typical reciprocating compressor, a cylinder and a piston. In this compressor, gas enters the cylinder and is trapped inside the cylinder. The gas is then forced into a smaller space by the action of a piston. Forcing the gas into a smaller space increases the pressure of the gas. The compressed gas is then discharged. Centrifugal compressors work differently. A centrifugal compressor uses a device called an impeller to spin the gas around, which accelerates or increases the speed of the gas flow. The acceleration gives the gas energy. As the gas stream flows out of an impeller, it spreads out and slows down. As the gas slows down, its energy is converted into pressure. Although positive displacement and centrifugal compressors operate differently, they share certain characteristics. For example, all compressors are rated according to discharge pressure and flow rate. Discharge pressure is usually expressed in terms of pounds per square inch, or PSI and flow rate is often expressed in units of cubic feet per minute, or CFM. All compressors also require some form of drive mechanism. Electric motors, such as this one, are commonly used to drive compressors. Other drive mechanisms you may encounter include gasoline engines and steam or gas turbines. Compressors are used in many different types of compressed gas systems, and a particular facility may have several compressed gas systems. We can use this simplified illustration to identify the basic components of a typical compressed air system. You may also hear a compressed air system referred to as a pneumatic system. The system includes a reciprocating compressor with two cylinders and two pistons, an intercooler, an aftercooler, a demister, a safety valve, and a receiver. The compressor is a multi-stage reciprocating compressor. A multi-stage reciprocating compressor contains two or more cylinders connected so that the discharge of one cylinder is directed into the inlet of another cylinder. The compressor in this example takes in air at atmospheric pressure and increases its pressure in two stages. In the first stage, the compressor increases the pressure of the air to approximately 25 psi. As the air is compressed, its temperature increases. The air that leaves the first stage of the compressor is routed to the intercooler. The intercooler is a shell and tube heat exchanger. As the air passes through the tubes in the intercooler, it is cooled by water flowing around the tubes. The cooled air from the intercooler is routed to the second stage of the compressor. In the second stage of this compressor, the air's pressure is increased to approximately 120 psi. From the second stage, the compressed air is sent to the aftercooler, which is another shell and tube heat exchanger. As the compressed air passes through the tubes in the aftercooler, it is cooled by water flowing around the tubes. During the cooling process, any water vapor that is in the air condenses. As a result, there may be moisture in the compressed air. So, the compressed air is sent from the aftercooler to the demister, which removes moisture from the compressed air. Moisture is removed to prevent it from damaging equipment that uses compressed air. Inside the demister, the compressed air is swirled around inside a cylinder. The swirling action causes the heavier moisture to separate from the lighter air and collect in the bottom of the cylinder. The moisture is then drained from the system. The dry compressed air is routed to other components in the system. The function of the safety valve is to protect the system from excessive pressure. If too much pressure builds up, the safety valve will open to relieve the pressure. The receiver is a tank that's used to store dry compressed air. From the receiver, the compressed air is sent through piping to other systems at 120 psi. All of the piping that contains the 120 psi air is referred to as the plant air header or the service air header. The service air header runs throughout the plant to supply air to the equipment that needs it. But pneumatic instruments require compressed air that is extremely clean and dry and at a lower pressure than the air supplied by the plant air header. Providing this quality of air requires devices such as an oil separator, a desiccant dryer, filters, 
and a pressure-reducing valve. A small amount of oil is frequently present in the air discharged from a compressor. Since this oil can damage control system components, it must be removed. This function is carried out by an oil separator. The oil that is removed collects in the bottom of the separator and is often drained to a waste system. A desiccant dryer removes moisture that may be present in the air. Filters remove any solid impurities that may be present. Dry filtered air that is suitable for use in a control system is typically stored in a receiver until it is needed. Then it is sent to a pressure reducing valve. The valve's function is to reduce the 120 PSI air to 50 PSI for use in pneumatic instruments and devices throughout the plant. The compressed air coming out of the pressure reducing valve is distributed by an instrument air header. The instrument air header supplies 50 PSI air for use in pneumatic control systems. This pressure can be further reduced by the devices that get compressed air from this header. Compressors can be hazardous for several reasons. One is that they have moving parts. To help prevent your clothing from being caught, make sure your shirt is tucked in. And don't wear any jewelry that could get caught in moving parts. Compressors can also be hazardous because heat is generated when gas is compressed. The outside surfaces of a compressor can get very hot, so be careful not to come in contact with the hot surfaces. To lessen the risk of getting burned, it's a good idea to wear long sleeve shirts made of cotton or other natural fibers. The sleeves should be rolled down and cuffs buttoned whenever you're working around operating compressors. Compressors are also extremely noisy. Personnel who do not wear appropriate hearing protection may risk a permanent hearing loss. There are also hazards associated with compressed gas systems. For example, leaks in a compressed gas system can blow dirt or dust around the work area at high speeds. For this reason, eye protection, such as safety goggles or glasses, should be worn by personnel working around these systems. Pneumatic tools and rubber hoses that are used with compressed air systems must be kept in good condition and inspected before each use. If the equipment is not in good condition, an accident could happen. If a 120 PSI air hose parts, it could whip about and strike someone nearby, causing a serious injury. Some compressed gases, such as hydrogen, may be flammable or explosive. So open flames and spark producing equipment should never be used around these systems. Some compressed gas systems may contain gases that are toxic, and some may contain gases that displace air. In either case, these systems may make surrounding areas unsafe to breathe in if a leak occurs. Plant procedures may require the use of a respirator by anyone working around such systems. Harmful gases present in compressed gas systems are usually identified by warning signs, which alert personnel that a hazardous gas is used in the area. In many facilities, it may be necessary to have certain areas tested for toxic gases before anyone is allowed to work there. Compressors often have devices or systems that remove foreign material from gases, remove excess heat, and provide lubrication. For example, filters are often used to remove foreign material from a gas before the gas is compressed. If small particles of dust or other foreign material are allowed to enter a compressor, they can cause the compressor to wear excessively and eventually fail. An air compressor typically has some type of filtering device in the intake line to remove dust and other foreign materials. The filtering devices are often paper or cloth filters. Another important job that must be performed for a compressor is cooling. When a gas is compressed, heat is produced. This heat can cause two major problems. First, most compressors are oil lubricated, and excess heat can break down oil, causing it to lose its lubricating characteristics. If this occurs, the compressor's internal components can be severely damaged. Gases expand when they're heated, and since a compressor is designed to compress gases, this effect creates an additional force that the compressor must overcome. In other words, more work is required to compress a given amount of gas when the gas is heated. Two techniques that can be used to remove excess heat from compressors and compressed gases are air cooling and water cooling. An air-cooled compressor is easily identified by metal fins on its casing. The fins provide increased surface area, allowing more of the surrounding air to come in contact with the casing and therefore keep the compressor cooler. Water cooling can be accomplished in two ways. One way is to use jackets. A jacket is a chamber that surrounds the compressor. 
Water is circulated through the jacket to cool both the compressor and the gas inside it. The other method of water cooling cools just the compressed gas. This method involves one or more shell and tube heat exchangers. Depending on their location, these heat exchangers are classified as either intercoolers or aftercoolers. The main difference between intercoolers and aftercoolers is where they're located in the flow path of the compressed gas. Intercoolers are generally used with multi-stage compressors and are located between the stages. Cooling the gas between stages in a multi-stage compressor is one way that excess heat can be removed. Another way to remove excess heat is to cool the gas after the compression process is complete. The device that does this is called an aftercooler. Another important compressor system is its lubrication system. The main function of a compressor's lubrication system is to reduce friction between the compressor's moving parts. Lubrication also helps to cool the compressor's parts and to keep gas from leaking out of the compressor. The main parts of this lubrication system are an oil pump, a filter, a heat exchanger, and an oil injector, which is commonly called an oiler. Oil from the compressor flows into the pump. The oil is then pumped through the filter, which removes any solid particles from the oil. Next, the oil flows through the heat exchanger, where it is cooled. From the heat exchanger, most of the clean, cool oil flows directly back to the compressor to lubricate some of its moving parts. But some of the oil flows to the oiler. The oiler supplies a small amount of oil to the compressor cylinder. In the cylinder, piston rings are used to maintain a seal between the piston and the cylinder. The oil lubricates the piston rings and helps seal the space between the cylinder wall and the rings. Compressed gas systems use auxiliary devices to remove oil or moisture from compressed gas and to prevent overpressurization. Two devices that are used to remove liquids from compressed gas are oil separators and demisters. Most reciprocating compressors that contain pistons use oil to lubricate the piston rings. During compression, some of the oil can become mixed in with the gas. This oil must be removed from the gas to prevent system equipment from being damaged. Oil removal is accomplished using oil separators. This illustration of an oil separator includes an inlet, a series of baffle plates, a wire mesh screen, a sump, and a gas outlet. Compressed gas that enters the oil separator passes around the baffle plates. As the gas travels around the plates, it is forced to make rapid changes in direction. Because oil is heavier than gas, it is more difficult for the oil to make the changes in direction. As a result, the oil droplets separate from the gas, collect on the baffles, and then drip down into the sump. In this way, most of the oil is removed from the gas. After the gas passes the last baffle, it flows through the wire mesh screen. Most of the small amount of remaining oil is trapped by the screen and then drips into the sump. The relatively oil-free gas continues on through the outlet. The next auxiliary device we'll look at is a demister. Air and other gases generally contain some moisture vapor. When gases are compressed and then cooled, the vapor often condenses into liquid droplets that can damage some types of pneumatic equipment. To prevent this from happening, moisture separators or demisters are often used to remove these droplets. This illustration of a demister includes a shell, a gas inlet line, a liquid outlet line, and a gas collector, which is connected to a gas outlet line. As moist gas enters the demister, it begins spinning. Because liquids are heavier than gases, centrifugal force causes liquid to separate from the gas and hit the shell. The liquid runs down the shell and out through the liquid outlet. The gas enters the collector and leaves through the gas outlet. Another auxiliary device that may be used along with a demister when extremely dry gas is required is a desiccant dryer. A desiccant dryer uses chemicals called desiccants to remove moisture from compressed gas. Two commonly used desiccants are silica gel and activated alumina. This is a simplified illustration of one type of desiccant dryer. The desiccant is contained in two tanks. The dryer also has a gas inlet, a gas outlet, a waste gas outlet, two heating coils, and two devices that are known as four-way or reversing valves. At any particular time, one of the two tanks is said to be active. 
An active tank contains dry desiccant that is used to remove moisture from compressed gas. In the other tank, desiccant is being dried or regenerated. In this example, the dryer is set up so that each tank can either be an active tank or a regeneration tank, depending on the positions of the four-way valves. The desiccant in the active tank removes moisture from the gas that flows through it. Most of the dry gas leaves the dryer through the gas outlet. However, a portion of the dry gas is routed through the regeneration tank to help dry the desiccant in that tank. The heating coil in the regeneration tank is energized to heat the gas that passes through the tank. The hot gas then dries the desiccant in the tank. In this example, the gas that leaves the regeneration tank is vented to atmosphere through the waste gas outlet. Switching back and forth between tanks is often controlled by a timer. After one tank has been regenerated for a preset period of time, the timer changes the positions of the four-way valves. This way, the desiccant that was regenerated is used to dry the gas, while the desiccant that was used to dry the gas is regenerated. Compressed gas that is clean and dry is usually stored until it is needed in the facility. Typically, containers called receivers are used for this purpose. Receivers are large tanks that store compressed gas so that compressors don't have to operate continuously. In most facilities, the demand for compressed air and other gases varies greatly and the pressure in the compressed gas system can vary with demand. To keep the pressure from rising uncontrollably, some method of regulating the pressure must be used to control the amount of gas that is delivered by the compressor. Pressure regulating methods range from a simple on-off system to more sophisticated methods such as the use of inlet valve unloaders. When pressure is regulated by a simple on-off system, a sensor in the receiver controls the compressor's drive mechanism. When the pressure in the receiver increases to a preset value, a signal is sent to stop the compressor. When the pressure in the receiver drops to another preset value, a signal is sent to restart the compressor. Large compressors tend to be more efficient if they operate continually. So one device that is commonly used to prevent overpressurizing the receiver is an inlet valve unloader. This is a simplified illustration of a portion of a compressor system that uses an inlet valve unloader. The unloader consists of a piston and a connecting rod, which is connected to the inlet valve on the compressor. A pressure sensing line is connected from the unloader to the receiver. Gas from the receiver fills the pressure sensing line. As the pressure in the receiver increases, it moves the piston and the connecting rod and opens the compressor's inlet valve. With the inlet valve open, the gas that enters the compressor is pushed back out again and is not compressed. When the pressure in the receiver decreases, the pressure on the unloader piston also decreases, allowing the inlet valve to move back and forth normally, and the compressor resumes normal operation. Another type of auxiliary device that prevents excessive pressure is a safety valve. If other means of controlling the pressure fail, a safety valve opens to relieve excess gas pressure that might otherwise cause personal injury or damage plant equipment.